Um, all right, so welcome everyone. Welcome back to um, Mastering Shiny Book Club. Um, so I'm going to be talking about chapter four today, which is about um, basic reactivity. Um, uh, so, uh, and I'm putting the videos on so that I know if there are any expressions or anything, uh, you know, any questions come up. So I've tried to, um, so uh, Russ, this is for you. I think I, I still don't know how to work with book downs. I've not added my notes to it yet. Okay. Um, what, what you're seeing right now is an R markdown with the shiny runtime. So okay. this is how I've been trying to make my notes so far. Sure. So we'll talk after this on how we okay. work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything, any, anything you've got, we'll, we'll be able to um, make something that, that will fit into the book down form. Perfect. It's, it's probably not perfect for a, a shiny um course really to do everything in a kind of static book down thing but um yeah, yeah. um but anything you've got we'll, we'll be able to um okay. make it make sense in in, in sure. the book down okay. thing. Um, yeah and uh yeah so i i was until until like five minutes ago i was working on uh, you know getting making sure, making sure all, all the topics were covered and i i don't think i have like everything as as well but We'll, we'll see how, how best I can do. So um, to start off this um, topic, you know, this, this chapter is mainly about helping us understand how reactivity works for all the shiny apps that we, um, we you know, we, we, we aim to build. So the, um, of course the concept lies with, for, for shiny, the main components that we always deal with are the UI, there is a server. So you pass the inputs through UI, you receive them um, or you read them into the server. Uh, you know, if there are any changes, then you accordingly move your um, modify or change the outputs. Uh, and, and literally this is the, uh, you know, in the simplest terms, the concept of reactivity. So as the input changes, you change your output. Um, so, now to understand that better, if I were to visually, um, uh, I mean, this chapter really, you know, in 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 the large, it, it's a large chapter, but it in, in essence is trying to help us understand that we want to visually see how that works because um, a that also helps us um, make changes or to make it more efficient and uh, cleaner code uh, when we when we make our graphs, but we'll get to that later. So. Um, now, the important things to understand here is that in our uh, normal R script that, you know, we have all done prior to moving to Shiny is that R scripts are always uh, based off of sequential logic. And I've used diagrammer package here to, you know, make these charts because I, I wanted to have as much as visual understanding of things as possible. However, in reactive programming, um, it's all based off of graph of dependency, which in turn means that it's not going to follow, um, you know, a line one, line two, line three uh, kind of a execution. Um, we'll talk about, or I'll try and explain what graph of dependency means, but what um, going back to um, the simple explanation that I said of reactivity earlier was, there is an input, there is a connection of input to the output, and when input changes, the output changes. So, um, uh, diagrammatically, you can, uh, you know, then try and see how these uh, relationships are, uh, because in, in a simple app, uh, if, the, if there's just one input and just one output, um, the relationship is simple and, you know, that there is that linear relationship. But as our apps become more complex, there are, you know, multiple dependencies, um, the graph becomes, the, the reactive graph or the graph of dependencies becomes uh, more, more complex and we are always in situations where we couldn't make them, uh, refine them at least a little more. So um, like I was saying, so just to re reiterate uh, some learnings from the prior chapters, we have uh, the main um, components of the app. You know, we've talked about our four out of which um, we have the, um, I'm trying to think, so why did I say four? So we have the UI component, we have the, um, server component and then you know there's a shiny app function that basically runs everything so when when we say um, the ui of the front end which is the ui object um, that helps us do following things that you know when uh, it contains the html code that is presented to every user and i i wanted to bring this up again because it helps um, helps us focus on what we what we're going to do forward so uh, like i said so it the UI is is going to be a standard. So if you if you go look at any app, um, I'm going to open this. Can you see this app that uh, I have it on the screen? Uh, it's loading right now. Okay. 
this to be thing to have. So can you see this app? Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. So yeah, so um so um so if anyone to over to open this link, which is from the book, um, this UI, the HTML display would always look the same. But if you and I at the same time were to change these inputs, my change in input will not reflect to yours. So what we are really um, saying is going back to this point. So the front end is always same for every user. Um, but coming to the back end, the server object is what is different because what I'm seeing, what the, the, what I, the input that I'm changing is only changing my output and it's not changing your output. So that makes, that means an isolation of environment is um, what I'm, I'm trying to bring up. Um, and every, every user has an independent version of their app. Um, again, um, just reiterating that every time, um, app is run, uh, it creates a new version or a new environment of its own and in each session has its unique state. Okay, Shamshuddin, you have a question? Yeah, so this is a dumb question. Um, I don't know why um, uh, every time one needs to reload Shiny because right now you need to reload that app to get this running. So does that mean when the Shiny app went into production, people need to reload it every time? Do you get my question? I'm not sure. So right. Okay. So now before you open the shiny app, the one you recently closed, yep. I saw that you reload it, right? You click reload. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the meaning of this? Does that mean if shiny app went into production and someone uh, opened an app which is shiny and maybe took a time before he um, uh, go into another page, when he comes back, he need to reload it? This is not the normal behavior I know for web pages. I don't understand why. Can you explain that? I think if I don't have answer to that question. I, I don't know if it sleeps, but I, I, I think I want to ask the group, even I, I don't know why this happens. So it kind of sleeps or what? So, uh, you know, I understand yeah, what you're sure. saying because I've always wondered why that happens. Yeah, yeah it kind of sleep and you need to work it out. I don't know why. I have a work app where I have the same issue and I, since I don't know what this is called or what this issue is, I don't know how to fix it yet. So please, if anybody knows this. Um, I think I joined late uh, for this uh, question. Is the question like, why do you have to reload the app every time you... Um, yeah, yeah. So the question is, yeah. So if you uh, if you load it, you know, on a on a web browser once, and then it's in the session is inactive for a while, you would see it grays out, and then you have to sort of uh, go to the browser and reload it, or you know, enter again um, from the URL. Um, I'm I'm not sure if this is the answer, but I think shiny apps are single page web apps, and so when you create the app it actually contains all the JavaScript, et cetera, and it's sent to the client. So let's say you change something uh, on RStudio, you added some functionality. It doesn't necessarily like appear on the browser until you refreshes it. So it fetches all of what was just created. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Maybe I'm talking about something else. I always thought it was because, uh, you know, Shiny App uses up a certain amount of memory. Um, and so at some point, uh, the Shiny server wants to get back its memory. And so it kills an inactive app. Okay. Um, I mean, that's, that's what I've always kind of assumed. Um, you know, it could be for other reasons than that. But I mean, that always seemed to make sense to me. Yeah, and that's okay. That's but um, do you think this is something good um, in production, uh, for instance, for clients? Um, you, you are presenting maybe something they need to reload your app every time. It, this is not, I mean, in terms of um, productivity, um, this is no good. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it frustrates me. I mean, personally, if I had to come to a site to do some stuff, and uh, if I went somewhere, I need to reload it again and again. I don't know. Um, I don't know if there is a better ways to um, keep the shiny um, running. I don't know. Okay, let's go. 
Yeah, I, I don't think it's, I mean, I've given uh, Robert's um, logic, I feel comfortable with that because I think uh, shiny apps are usually, you know, always on the heavier memory user side. So I kind of can buy that logic that, you know, it, it frees up the, those and hence it, they're, they're killed. But for, for a user, if you still have it in app, you basically don't see that activity and that you don't see that active session, basically. Um, yeah, but then it, I, but I'm not sure if like, exactly technically what's the reason behind it, like I said earlier. So, okay. Um, or maybe we can uh, put this question in further in the group and see if more people can answer it. But I think for now I can uh, move forward. So, um, so yeah, so we were talking about the server function and, um, Given that it's a little more complex than a simple UI, uh, let's dig deeper into it. Um, Sorry, uh, I just I just read up on it a little bit. It's actually uh, it goes to gray when the client has disconnected from the server. I don't know if you can force a client to stay connected to a server, um, and I don't know if you can ex ex increase the time um, that a server won't time out from a client. But that's the reason why it goes gray. Okay, so then I would think. Yes, you can make those changes because there is a session function. Uh, there's a session object in um, server function, right? So um, I have to figure that out, but it makes me think that we can make those changes. Okay, um, cool. So back to the server function details. Now, um, so this chapter basically uh, talks about a little bit in detail of what this input, output, and session arguments for this uh, server function look like. Uh, or you know their data type and, and such. Um, so input function is a list-like object, and um, and this I've heard like you know a, a question that comes came before was if you look at the way they are used right the input and output objects you say input dollar sign and then the input ID, but if you were you know if you if you had noticed in if you write input dollar in in your code and then you would do a tab like in general like if it's a data frame dot a dollar you would see um, the column names would appear like in a drop down, but it does not happen so in, in this case, because um, you know input is a, it's a special kind of object. It's a list like object and it's not a normal um, R code um, uh, object. And uh, it's used for receiving an input from the uh, browser, from the user. Um, okay, this was supposed to be a list, so it, it's coming like this. And it can only be read um, from a React, so it's only a read-only um, kind of, a, so the values or the input IDs that you would notice, that you would observe are, are being used in the app, they can only be read-only, which means that you cannot write them or you cannot update them. And the reason for that is, you know, as the book mentions, is you want to maintain that uh, source of, single source of truth. Uh, so there are, uh, situations when we would update these inputs and um, you know he said you know uh, Hadley says that we, we will talk about that in um, in the future chapters but typically those scenarios are when um, so let me maybe uh, explain that with an example so if you were to uh, if the app basically has an option where it says you know select a data set or maybe upload a file and then it allows you and then basically the next step or the next um, select input option is to uh, that gives you the column names of the selected data set so now th since the app is allowing you to you know choose the input that you need at at, at a higher level then your uh, next input um, uh, select input field or um, uh, what do you call that the widget is basically dependent on the previous selection. So now this thing needs to update. So uh, there, there is a, a widget called update select input, which is what, you know, something that we will talk about in next chapters is something that uh, would update once that input has changed. So it is still read only, but it can be updated um, in certain scenarios with, with specific uh, circumstances. But in general, um, input object is or and, and specific input IDs are always read only. Uh, and also, uh, I think one thing that it, uh, this this book highlights, uh, this chapter highlights, is that an input should always be read in from an uh, from a reactive context. 
um and uh, for those who have you know done some uh, some writing of apps they would understand or they definitely have gone through those errors where you know which when it says that um uh, so the the input that you're trying to read is, is expected to be in a reactive context or did you forget render function or you know did, did you mean to write a reactive so uh, and like i said so re render text or render functions for example and then the reactive functions and then there are more similar to that are uh, what provide a reactive context. And again, um, when I say reactive, uh, let's think back to uh, understanding that reactive meaning reacting to the changes in input and then replicating or uh, in, uh, initiating the changes to the output corresponding to that uh, change in input. Um, now moving on to the output object, which is the second argument here. Um, it's similarly to an input argument, uh, input, yeah, input argument, it's an input object. It is also a list-like object. Uh, again, doing a dollar will not work because it's special here. It is the uh, output object and the object IDs corresponding to an output object are the ones that would receive the, um, uh, sorry, they would receive the input and then they're, they're used to send the output back uh, to the uh, user. And you always, always use uh, the op output objects uh, using the render functions. And then it sets you up for it, it sets up the reactive context and also renders the HTML for the user. Um, am I going too fast, too slow? Just want to do a rain check. Are we all good? Okay. Should I keep going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems, it seems okay. to me. Cool. So um, one interesting thing that um, I think was very different for me uh, and I think would be for all other app users would be the, it, it says that, you know, there's this mental model that we sort of want to understand when we work on Shiny is, is that of tell versus inform. So we are very used to doing, you know, uh, looking at it from a, from a telling perspective that when uh, in, a, in a simple R code, for example, I would tell my code to, you know, I would, and how, how I would tell is by writing one line of code saying, do this, do this, do this. And, you know, it would do it one at a time in, in that order. However, in Shiny, it's, it's more of an informative uh, approach that it takes where, uh, and the example that it says is that you tell, you give Shiny recipes and you don't give it commands. So you, you're basically giving it a recipe of how this can be done or how things can uh, you know, for example, if you were to make a sandwich, you would uh, inform Shiny that this is the recipe to make a sandwich. And then I, when I come back, I want to be able to look at uh, a sandwich in my refrigerator. Um, so, it, I mean, I think it's interesting and with, with a great analogy. Um, so now within that mental model of how to do that information, you know, being informative and not telling or not commanding uh, to the app, um, there are a few things that... Uh, uh, Shamsuddin, is there a question? Yeah, so okay. um, uh, this question, I think, is the English that I don't understand and uh, someone in English can as well. So, yeah, so um, the, here where you made mention about um, the imperative and declarative, um, uh, the imp uh, imperative is the normal way we use our code, right? Mm -hmm. uh, declarative is, um, yeah, so he made mention a, a statement where uh, I shared in the chat where he said imperative code code is assertive, declarative code is passive aggressive. Mm -hmm. So this English is so difficult for me to understand. So I don't know what does that mean? Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> oh, I guess I'll invite others to maybe um, talk about it. I, I have that here, but if anybody else wants to share their thoughts. I mean, are we just trying to figure? Yeah, are we just? Do you just need kind of a an explanation of what the difference between assertive and passive aggressive is? Yeah, I think so. So assertive is basically like um, you will go and you will go and eat your dinner, and passive aggressive would be like, well, you know, all the good kids eat their dinner. I certainly wish that you were a good kid. So it's not like out and out, like telling them to do something, but it's obviously making the insinuation that you want them to do something. Um, All right, gotcha. Okay, cool. 
Thanks, Robert. Cool. Thanks, Thank Shamsi, you, Robert. Thanks. Uh, all right. So I guess he he his question actually did did my job of pulling up the next piece, which was um, trying to explain the difference between imperative versus declarative programming. Uh, and again, it's di this difference is important because um, this is a difference between our code or our script versus a shiny app script. Um, so, like I said, so imperative programming is about issuing a certain commands and you know doing it in order immediately. Uh, while declarative programming is sort of expressing the goals, um, you know, talking about the important constraints, and you know, letting letting the the other party do it. Uh, let's say so. You know, uh, the book says relying on the other person to decide on how and when you want to translate that into action, and how this relates to an app is um, that. Uh, I mean, I think in fact, though the next two topics actually um, sort of follow through in that is so when so one thing that uh, if you notice in this chapter is that the order of the um, the code that you write in this uh, in in an app is does not matter. So uh, and and for for the same reason that you know when inputs are changing the output like all all the codes are being uh, executed. I mean. We still should not do the haphazard order that the example that is mentioned there. We, we don't want to uh, use a variable before it is created. Uh, but if if even if we did, uh, it would still work fine like a like a normal uh, code. The the difference is that uh, you you don't um, so only when the inputs change, your outputs would change, and uh, only then um, you know your uh, like the the processing in in the in between would happen. So only, uh, for example, if uh, if I were to go here in this app example, which is uh, down again, so only when I change this input will the graph change, uh, and you know, in, if any one of them. So uh, I hope it made, made some sense. But if um, so, if it was a if it was an R script, you know. What you would have to do is basically, if any one input changes, you you have to run the rerun the entire code, and I think that's sort of the benefit this that this provides, um, and then also the uh, the freedom of um, changing only one or more output input. Sorry, uh, I don't know if that made sense. Um, let me let me see if we can if I can explain this further with with the next um, topics. So, um, to, so again, to on the point that you know when when we say it relies on the user to user as in the sorry app designer to um, or, or the app maybe that's the right word. So it so this um, the declarative pro, when when we say declarative programming or the reactive programming, it it really uh, depends on the app to decide how and when to translate that action. Uh, translate that into an action it provides us you know a laziness um, or lazy environment because it a, a shiny app on its own it tries to do only minimum minimal amount of work uh, needed to update the output controls um, and uh, it, it talks about do i need to go back go to the chapter uh, maybe to talk about it let's see uh Um. um i have um i input um so before the laziness section uh where you discuss about the imperative and um uh, declarative um so mm -hmm. how did you made mention uh turning your code into uh declarative um is somehow difficult right mm -hmm. so i don't know why he said that is it always i mean difficult um because i know in imperative programming you just write your code in sequence so huh. uh yeah but in declarative he said um is that is the downside um for that downside for that um to frame your code into declarative system so uh, since uh, this is just the beginning so uh, turning your code into declarative system is it difficult Um, it's not so much that it's difficult. It's just that it isn't really, it isn't the way that you would first do it. 
Um, it's not, yeah, it's not that intuitive, right? Yeah. yeah, I find that at the beginning, a lot of my code looks very imperative. Um, but by the end of the time the Shiny app is completed, it ends up looking significantly more declarative because, oh, I need to add on this extra thing. Okay, I'm just going to put it at the end, uh, end of the code. Oh, I need to add on this other thing, you know, put it at the end of the code, rather than going back through and reconfiguring how everything is being done. Yeah. Okay. And also you need to uh, sometimes put all your uh, code into functions somehow like that, right? Right. That but also gets... Modularization. I okay. Know. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. That also gets a little bit weird because, you know, you can put them outside of your server function or you can put them in a global.r file or in a bunch of different places. And in those cases, like, you don't even have to have a reference to it, like within within a server function other than to the, to the function itself. And so, you know, if you're trying to follow along, it's not gonna make any sort of sense. Um, and that's okay because it runs it when it needs to. Right, right. And, and I think to, to piggyback on your point, when you said it, it does not have to, it does not follow, you know, like the order of the lines that you have it because um, so if there is this reactive expression that depends on an input, you have to jump back up. You, you've got to look at what that input is and then how that is being used. And then you come back, get that value, put that in the code, do a bunch of things. Then it, it, uh, if it's a reactive expression, you know, um, it maybe it goes into the actual output. This was an intermediate uh, consumer, I guess, uh, or producer, producer of the um, um uh, reactive producer and then then you send it to the output which then goes as you know I don't know table output in the UI so yeah crazy stuff <laughs> okay thanks Robert for uh, asking uh, answering the uh, part of the question so moving on um, so I guess we've covered laziness um, and I think now we're moving to the most important uh, at least for me it felt like the most important and difficult to explain a uh, piece of the chapter is the reactive graph. So now um, to, first of all, let's define what the reactive graph is. It's basically the uh, order of execution, which, you know, we know that it's not the linear fashion or, you know, not following the line, every line by line code. Um, but uh, understanding what piece of code would run when, um, and then it's in, uh, in, within a reactive graph, basically what happens is you're describing the relationship between uh, the inputs and outputs or how they're connected. Um, so for example, for a simple app that uh, is probably not shown here, but um, where, uh, you know, the, the app that is given in the chapter, which basically says you, your input is, um, the in, you know, input ID is name, you, the user would enter that in a text input. And then you generate a greeting output with that, uh, where basically you're saying hello, and then you paste the name uh, from that name from the input ID. So this uh, is an uh, again. I'm I'm uh, gonna bring this up. So you can do it in multiple ways. You can um, uh, from you know for for a beginner, you you know to understand what you're doing in the app, you want to probably do it with hand. Uh, or I've learned a better way to do it, which is using diagrammer package with just a caveat that um, the book shows that this should be a triangular, like one side triangular function um, image like this. But with the, that package, I, I couldn't find a way to make it like this. Uh, so if you can go back, you would see what, what this really means is, you know, if this thing, it's like this, uh, and then something that can totally fit into this. And, and, and logically, so it, it just shows that, you know, this is the input and this is the output. So this input is feeding into the output. So that's how um, they want to explain it. But with the diagrammer package, which I've used to create this right now, um, I, I had uh, trouble finding that arrow thing. Yeah, yeah. I think if, if, if and maybe next time, if you need that graph, if I were you, I can just quickly go into the uh, books, uh, GitHub, and just copy the code for that and paste it. Oh, right. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. But I was actually wondering, and I wasn't sure if they, you know, in the book they've used that, or um, because there is an op there is an actually an excellent package called React Log. 
which can automatically do do that for you. So maybe especially when when you have complex um, apps, and if you want to see if there are ways to optimize it, I think uh, this package could tell you um, how you know, like what your reactive graph looks like, and then you have a sense of uh, then you would try and maybe you can by looking at it you can get better sense of how you can improve it. Because let me uh, talk about you know one example that that's there in the uh, example in the book. Which you know, when you when you start looking at that app and the um, reactive graph of it, you you start to make sense of you know there is the redundancy already there, or are, is this connection really needed? And that's how you start cutting on it using reactives, and then you know you basically just want to you're trying to make them so independent that only if this input changes, you want to change the uh, other related outputs and if not if, if this input doesn't change nothing else in this section would change so that should not be impacted and then you sort of want to isolate things that are not dependent on on each other so um and and that leads me to the concept of reactive expressions um again uh, pulling that same example um from the book um, you know i wanted to sort um, of show excuse me. Um, what do you say about this package, React Log? Sorry, React Log. What do you say about yeah, it? Yeah, React Log is basically that helps you um, automatically uh, make those reactive graphs, which I think ah, okay. uh, are used, must be used in the book. So that's okay. why I didn't look at the codes yet. All right. Okay. 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 Yeah. So this was the package that I used. Um, so I, I wanted to, I think, have a little fun with this also. <laughs> And this, I, I think I should use when I, I know I have complex ones, uh, complex apps at work. So to see how I can make them more efficient because that helps you look at the reactive graph automatically of what you are doing right now. And then with that, you can start to think, do I really need this kind of connection? So maybe while well, I'm talking, uh, actually, I will come to that later because let's start with a simple one. So, um, so this is a simple example uh in in the book here yeah so this is what i was talking about so what really is happening in this app is in the server function you are creating the greeting um uh, output object using a render text and like i said so render allows you to use um re basically it allows you that reactivity so as the input dollar name the name field will from the ui would change the hello uh, the the this string will change and then what is displayed in the as as a greeting function uh, sorry greeting object would change in the ui so this is how the reactive graph for that would look like however if we uh, and again he says that you know this is a very simple one we probably don't need the reactivity here but this is just for the demo demonstration purposes if I added, uh, created a new variable string, which uses the reactive function, this is the important piece. So if uses a reactive function, and then you know you you copy that paste um, statement here inside this reactive expression, and then what we are rendering is this. And uh, I think again we had this conversation last time. So every time you're using a reactive expression, you have to have those parentheses followed by it. Otherwise, uh, it won't work. And this is this is how the uh, shiny system is set up. So now when, when you do this, uh, you're basically introducing an additional um, component to the reactive graph. And at this point, it may not seem so important, but it is pretty useful when, uh, when we want to execute that reusability and uh, reducing the redundancy in, in the codes. Um, it's it's a, sort of similar to, you know, if you think of in a R script, you create a variable and you want to reuse it in different places. So that's how it's and then you basically don't want to um re re rewrite maybe a few lines of code um every time you want to reuse that piece um going back so again uh, bringing up this example uh so yeah so i think the way i understand this uh looking at this reactive graphs is uh it, it helps us the sorry the reactive expressions is that it helps us um make the app look more cleaner and i will we'll look at that the bigger example uh, in the book itself uh, and also make it more efficient uh, going back to the point that i was saying so if you see once you see the reactive graph you will see that there are so many components that do not need to be sort of stay connected and you want to isolate those connections because uh, 
what would happen by default if you are if you all the this uh, there are so many multiple connections is that if one input changes the app in the background is going to rerun in entirety uh, and change the output objects but even though it's not related so do so to isolate and to remove those situations you know you know to saving those computation time would make our app uh, very efficient and hence we want to uh, hence it is preferred to use um, reactive expression and also when when you, we'll see an example so when we start using those reactive expressions we can also start to reduce our code redundancies um so uh, I, i want to quickly go over this though i have not personally used a lot of these terms but um, the book uh, introduces the concept of producers and consumers um, so what happens is in this specific case for example um, we we know that this isn't my input this is my output but what is this guy so this is the guy which contains that reactive expression right so this is the output of my reactive um, uh, expression or i think we can also call this reactive expression so reactive expression basically he says uh, is is a flavor of it has a flavor of both inputs and outputs and why so because it is taking an input from um from an input so this is like an output in that sense and then it also is passing an in, uh, the value from input to the output so it is also acting like an input so that's why it's you know in somewhere in between where it has a flavor of both of them so um which which hardly says now you know calls for a, a new vocabulary and what he says is this guy here this combination of pieces is producer because this this is a producer basically is a reactive producer i think is is a combination of the input and the reactive expression however this combination is what we're calling consumer because they are consuming the input so this uh, reactive expression and the output um hope this makes sense um i think I, i'm going to take a pause and see if we are good so far uh yeah i think we're i think we're good um i one thing i the i i thought that the um the way it was phrased in the book about the the, the producers was that anything that's an input is a producer and anything that say a reactive expression can be used as a producer um not necessarily that it's the kind of combination of inputs and reactive expressions that produces a a producer according to his um uh, um i think the way i um, read it when because these mistake. are the words from the book and it says it's it refers to the reactive inputs and expressions so and and i'll go back to the to the diagram which actually helped me understand that it's a combination i mean that's the reason why i said that was because you know this it, it brings it you know together in that one box and then this is basically reused but the reactive producer is this section because you know there is an input and it goes into a reactive expression and then there is this expression which goes then into the output and hence it is a consumer because these are the consumers of the input and then these are the producers to i mean i don't know if that's the right word but these are the producers that lead to the output so that's how um sort of i read them yeah <clears throat> so i think um the expression is something common to them so um right. i think this terminology is somehow used in uh software development i couldn't remember exactly but um, it's used um uh, maybe the input is the producer and the output is the consumer and they have some terminology in web development i think um, which really close related to this but i can remember that on top of my head right now okay so i think the only place i have seen this is um, is in one of the errors that i had i had seen in you know when i'm i'm making my shiny apps um but that also has been very rare so um i think if if i see the word reactive and then why things are not working i kind of just see that okay you know um what some especially when, you know when i'm trying to print something and then it says okay you can't do it you know it, it, this is a reactive expression and blah 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 um but i guess if something shows up as it needs a reactive consumer i guess this would help us um 
short list where we need to focus on i guess uh, but yeah i mean other than that I, I don't see that normally a lot in the coding places or you know when we have to try to troubleshoot things but except for the error that i've seen i think i have not encountered a lot of these words but that could just be me okay so um, assuming there are no more questions, I guess I will keep going. So um, so the next important piece uh, being the execution order. And I think I touched it earlier. So for a Shiny app, execution order is solely dependent on the reactive graphs, not on the um, layout of the code or you know, layout of the function or the lines of code. Um, and now is a good time to go back to this uh i guess long example so um so this example that he talks about basically um you know this he has some uh he has generated a, a quest um sorry a function which um takes two inputs and then uh, does a t test and then this uh, function also plots um and then we are using that uh, those functions and those inputs in uh, now we're going to put them into a shiny app to be able to modify those inputs to be able to generate the the plots uh, to to update those plots right so now um, as you, as we can see or we can we can based on our some background knowledge to the app we can understand that this is that output um, object these are my input objects um, and these are all modifiable this is a screenshot but this is that app so now if you if you look at this code here um, so this is the first version of it so these are our um, standard type inputs that allows me um, that option to you know um, we have the number n1 mean one standard deviation one two allow for distribution one for two and then uh, if there are any specifics we want to change about the diagram so and all these inputs would then go into uh, creating the uh, x and one inputs which would go into the function the frequency uh, poly function and then you know so he is now he's defining those inputs in the server function and then calling the function with this uh, so this is our first output and then there is a t-test output that uh, we are putting here displaying here and again so there are inputs that are used for that too so basically if you notice we are doing this twice inside each um what do you say each uh, output object so but then as of now you know if, if we were to make any changes things would always all appear and the only difference in uh, this we would, you know, I guess we'll understand later is when we when we look at the reactive graphs for these. So all these inputs that we defined in the UI are affecting all the outputs because uh, this is these are the two output objects and each of them is related to each of the uh, output. So this is what I was saying. I think when I was rambling a lot earlier is having drawn this, it gives us a sense of what is going on in the back end so if any one single input will change every all the recomputations would happen and then these two outputs would change and the display would change if how if you however want to go back to the fact that and i think i, I said it earlier these two statements are sort of being repeated and you know i mean again it's a smaller piece it's fine if you do it but if we were to use this, let's say in three other um, places or three other object creations, we would want to think about um, redundancy in this case. And then also that would uh, directly impact the efficiency or the computation timing also. So an answer to that is the reactive expression here and um, using the reactive. So basically all, all this changes is you're, you're bringing your code from inside of each um, uh, output uh, piece to uh, outside but within the server function and then x1 creation and x2 creation is now surrounded by a reactive function so you're giving all the inputs here uh, this this whole piece stays the same except that this is now um, covered in or surrounded by the the reactive function what this really means is x1 will change every time the related inputs will change x2 will change when anytime the related inputs will change 
and how that changes in the in terms of the reactive graph is now you see that instead of that whole web thing we have a, a much more refined um, execution system uh, meaning only these three inputs would modify this only these three inputs would modify this guy and then these two are only for this so not anything and everything will change anything and everything right and then uh, so these two reactive expressions would then eventually update uh, the output uh, objects uh, here is the piece where he you know says you know when um, it's a, it's a great software engineering practice to sort of isolate things as much as possible um, and uh, here i probably not going to be able to explain this piece i guess why we need this thing for me this is um, more of reducing the uh, redundancy that's that's all it's all about um okay so now um the the second last bit in in this chapter is about controlling the timing of evaluation uh and and i think in in interest of time what i'm going to do is quickly go over those functions probably uh just to sort of highlight like what are the things that we can use so there are uh, so when when we are uh, you know when when we talked about the laziness of the evaluation of you know only ch things would happen or only changes happen uh, when the inputs would change so you know the code will not run all the time otherwise um so if we wanted to change any timings with respect to those we could uh, do that with a timed invalidation meaning we can use a reactive timer function uh again it's a reactive uh, function so you could assign it to a variable and then use that uh, as a reactive variable to say you know if in the example he says reactive timer 500 milliseconds so then it allows you to see a little bit of animation and see when you want to uh, be able to make any changes the other option is to uh, especially for the you know computation intensive apps you want to give the user uh, you can do it on click or on an event which can be done uh, uh, using the combination of action buttons and event reactives and there are some more similar to that uh, which is which comes in the following uh, thing so observers can uh, also be used um so observer functions and event reactives so this uh, so these functions typically allow us to react only when there is an event so you know if um, so what i'm what this really means is for example in he gives an example of simulate but to give a very simple uh, you know example so if, if i am talking about say hello uh, and then i am adding the name whatever input your value you know the name id has takes the value from the id input id so now instead of every time you add a uh, a letter to it and then you know input basically changes and you, you know i the output would say hello p when I, let's say if i am entering my name so i'm i'm uh, priyanka and say um hello p hello pr hello pr i right so every time that input changes this the input becomes invalidated and then the recomputation happens if i were to uh, if i only wanted to see this change when i say I, my name is written and i could add a button saying okay go and then on go on click of go i would uh, you know this is an action happening with this action button and then my code would say uh, code would do the same you know the the reactive it's it's just the fact that it's it's going to be inside the reactive expression the pasting uh, code line of code and only when i say go then i say hello priyanka you know you, um, i hope i'm able to clearly give the difference of what was happening earlier and and now so um this is how you can sort of control when you want the code to be evaluated um so all other than even reactive um the other uh, options that we have are observer events uh, or observer functions so one of which is observe and then another one is observe event um however i i somehow learned this the hard way because i don't know if there is a specific um, text to to read about everything uh, all these reactive um functions but um the the learning for me personally was that event reactive is something that you can use if you want to define um, a separate variable so for example if i want if i'm reading uh, a data frame and i want to make some changes for example a filtering based on the user input i could create a you know a, a variable that i would then use to create the plot um 
but if that was not needed like you know if i just had to observe that something changed and i don't need to assign this to something then i can simply use an observe or observe event depending on whether i just want that to be constant watch or i want this evaluation to happen only by clicking of a button that would be observe or observe event but typically observe event and event reactive are kind of the parallels with the exception that do you want to save this uh, output or you don't so with that i guess that's all i have for going through this chapter um i've tried to cover as much as possible but uh, let me know if there are further questions any gaps that's it from my side okay okay so does anyone have any questions we've got five minutes left i guess with um how about the uh the, the the exercises in the chapter or anything like that was the any um issues raised during it anyone in the um i'm glad to see everyone's still here <laughs> um, yeah um maybe i got a question not related to the exercises um but to uh the reactive graph uh it's always seems that you go from uh, left to right in the graph something as uh, when you make an input and it goes to a reactive and then goes to the output but what if i want to update something uh, what which is reactive like adding a line to a uh, data frame or something and use this again i uh, what is the best possible way i i, I think i managed this with the observe event function once, but I don't think uh, this is the right way, or I don't know if this is the right way. And I might want to ask if someone has an idea what is the best way to update uh, something which is reactive and use it again, or yeah, maybe add lines to a data frame uh, again and again, something like this. I, I well, I've no idea. Um, it, it, so, it, is this not something that for which the the, the reactive expressions are a good fit, whereby um, I don't know, I can't quite visualize what you're trying to do, but presumably you've got a data frame as your input. You, you, can, you have a add... data frame, just say uh, an empty data frame at the beginning. And then the user can make inputs to this data frame. Like uh, they had three inputs for three uh, columns, uh, mm -hmm. three input um, elements for three uh, for the three columns of the data frame, and then he pushes an action button to insert uh, uh, this to a new row to the data frame, and he wants to do this again and again to add uh, further rows to the data frame. Uh, okay, so can you repeat the question then? Yeah, I can repeat. You have an, like an, uh, three input elements, let's say all numeric inputs. Mm -hmm. And uh, you want to, the user to give the chance to add an, a new row to a data frame, okay. which has three columns for the three input elements. Okay. And he can push, uh, an, an, he has a button, uh, like an action button or something like that. And here to say, add these three uh, uh, values to a new line in the data frame. Okay. And then he wants to do this again with three other input values to the okay. same data frame. Okay. So, yeah, so I think what, what's the question? You want to understand how the reactive graph for this would look like? more or less or how, how basically how the best way to do this uh oh okay you want to know whether to use the observe or the reactive function is that i mean more I or less never, so. i can never tell which one to use i just <laughs> use them both until it stops <laughs> failing yeah yeah i think uh even reactive would i, I would use that because um mm -hmm. what you're doing is so what you 
uh, and I think I struggled at these things too. So you you read those inputs, you create a data frame, and then you have to have the previous data frame, and then you sort of append it. So you can R bind. So assuming your your you know initial data frame is uh, let's say data, which has which was the last state of the uh, data that you have. When you rerun it, you want to say you create a data new data frame saying df, which has only one row. Every time it's only going to have one row, uh, which would be the value that you're supplying. Now, on click of the insert button or you know whatever input ID you're giving it, so you say even reactive. Uh, it would the it would go into data and then uh, inside also you want to say uh, R bind of data comma df. Uh, that's how I somehow visualize this. So definitely, this is this is a, a use case for reactive uh, expression, and I would use in event reactive because so and uh, with event reactive and observe event, the syntactically how you do it is you say input dollar the uh, action button name, comma mm -hmm. the rest of the stuff that you're doing. So you have the event. Uh, so basically, it just sees that whether the event click has happened or not. So true or false, and then. Um, the rest of the expression that needs to be evaluated when this is true or when this is more than zero. Okay, yeah, uh, that sounds uh, promising <laughs> for this example. I might try it, uh, to see how it um, works in practice. <laughs> Thank you much, very much. Okay, um, so if if everyone's gone quiet, um, thanks everyone for turning up, and, and and thanks to Priyanka for for preparing a, a presentation on quite a big chapter. Um, uh, so next time we'll be talking about the um, the the case study chapter, um, and then subsequent weeks are on the second part of the book. Um, firstly, about the the workflow of uh, of kind of building and debugging and things for for shiny apps. Um, yes, thanks everyone for for attending again. And uh, I hope I, I don't know. I hope the book club is uh, of benefit to you, to you all. I, I've certainly. I, I mean, I'd never even built a shiny app before two weeks ago. So um, yeah, it's it's helping me a great deal. Um, hopefully, it's as, okay. as as beneficial to the rest of you as well. Yeah, and I think presenting make is, is even is more helpful because I I, I struggled with this chapter myself. So <laughs> presenting, I had to spend so much more time and energy. Like I had to make sure I knew what I'm saying. <laughs> cool, right? So I, I uh, yeah. Um, so I think our time's up on the Zoom. So uh, thanks everyone for coming, and uh, hopefully I'll see you next week. This time next week. Okay. Bye. Cool. Bye. 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 Thanks for Bye. the presentation. Have a good week, everyone.